I have to say, it's, it's actually a long time since I've been to any talk at Dartmouth that has had people spilling out into the aisles. Part of it is we, it's in a smaller room than we often have. But nevertheless, the, the, uh, the attention and the interest in this topic is evident and it's terrific to see. Uh, I'm Daryl Press. I am a professor in the government department here at Dartmouth. And I'm also the coordinator of the War and Peace Studies program at the Dickey Center. Um, welcome to our panel discussion on cyber operations and national security. This is a topic which has already attracted great and also growing attention, not only within government circles and analyst circles, but also in the public media. Um, for the last week, almost every single day, there's been a page one or page two article about cyber threats or cyber conflicts in one of the major newspapers in the United States. And it looks like it's a trend that will continue. Why is that? I think there's two basic reasons. Number one, as we all know, our societies depend upon information technology functioning. You know, our societies deeply depend upon this. For the power grids that allow meetings like this to happen, as support for water distribution and food distribution networks, um, as the critical infrastructure in the financial services industry, in hospitals, societies depend, modern societies, on, on functioning IT infrastructure. Number two, Modern military forces depend on functioning IT infrastructure, obviously for communications, but also for the kind of broad set of command functions, for the intelligence function, for surveillance, for reconnaissance. And even independent of the ability or the need of, of military units to integrate together, most weapon systems now depend upon chips working effectively, probably basically everything but the knife. And so the question that this raises for us is, I guess, a series of questions. Number one, does the cyber domain create opportunities for, let's say, adversaries of the United States to substantially degrade US military operations without building up expensive, capable, conventional forces of their own? Number two, does the cyber domain create capabilities or opportunities for adversaries of the United States to create substantial harm or substantial disruption to civilian infrastructure in a very non-traditional way. Um, who, what kind of groups out there are developing sufficient capabilities to be able to do real harm with various cyber weapons? Is this the kind of thing which it will take very sophisticated state actors with flush coffers and hundreds and hundreds of programmers? Or might poorer countries and weaker countries also be able to carry this out? Or might non-state actors, groups of guys, Two unemployed guys in Kazakhstan pull off meaningful attacks against various cyber, cyber targets. What opportunities does it provide for the United States, either in the espionage realm or in the military realm, to do significant harm to the militaries or government functioning of, of adversaries of the United States? Or possibly, is this much ado about nothing? Is this a domain in which there's been a tremendous amount of exaggeration about vulnerability, tremendous amount of exaggeration about threats, and really it's military forces and intelligence organizations and contractors looking for missions? Where does it lie within kind of the, the worst case scenarios and the possibility that this is all big one, one big exaggeration? Um, let me say that six months ago, uh, Denise Anthony, Professor Anthony from the Sociology Department, and Tom Candon, both of whom are at ISTS, dreamed up this panel. And they basically said that we have a ton of expertise, very diffuse expertise here at Dartmouth in areas covering infrastructure security, um, uh, cyber security. A lot of it, though, was on the, the commercial side. A lot of it was people who were not necessarily focusing day and night on national security policy. And then there's also a, a broader group of people, some of them in the social sciences, students across the college who have interests in national security policy. And their insight was, let's try to marry these things up and have a panel to try to raise <coughs> these issues and see where we go from there. And so they get an awful lot of credit for starting this. And then they connected with me as the representative of the War and Peace Program through the Dickey Center. So this is a program here today that's sponsored by ISTS and the Dickey Center. I should also say that it's really the first of a series that we're going to be running throughout the year. So the panel today is terrific. We intend to have three more public events through the course of the year in the winter and the spring term. Dates and, and, and specific topics are, are TBA. It'll be announced very, very soon. So, so stay tuned for that. All right, enough of this. Let me turn to the panel really quickly. Um, uh, 
we have three terrific panelists today. Um, let me introduce them each very, very quickly right now, and then I'm just going to sit down and let them each give a presentation. The format for today is they're going to give brief presentations, probably about 10 minutes each, and then I'm going to try to help facilitate a conversation among them for probably about 20 minutes, and then we're going to turn it over to you guys for, for Q&A, so there'll be plenty of time for that. Panelist number one is Dr. Um, Herb Lin. Um, Dr. Lin is Chief Scientist at the Computer Science Telecommunications Board, National Research Council at the National Academies. He's the Director of Major Projects on Public Policy and Information Technology and has written some of the real seminal texts to this date, to date, about topics of cybersecurity, offensive information warfare, and cyber deterrence. So it, it's a great honor to have him here. Um, the second person to speak, I believe, Martin, are you going to go second? I guess I am now. There you are. <laughs> Second person to speak now is um, Martin Lebicki, who is a senior scientist at RAND, and he's been focusing on the impact of information technology on national and domestic security for many years, and he recently authored um, um, a manuscript called Cyber Deterrence and Cyber War, and is just um, one of the leading experts on this topic. Lastly, but not least, we have John Lindsay. Um, John uh, is a postdoc at UC San Diego. He just received his PhD at uh, MIT. He has a master's in computer science from Stanford, and his research in this domain, although he has a wide area of research, is on strategic use of cyberspace and the conduct of irregular warfare. Um, John Lindsay served as, the U as a, um, a U.S. Naval Intelligence Officer with air targeting and special operations units in Europe, Latin America, and Iraq. Um, yesterday or a few days ago, Tom pointed out that I can tell you purely by coincidence, all three of our panelists um, are, are graduates of MIT, and actually I am too. And so he suggested that I begin the whole event by leading you guys in the MIT fight song, <laughs> but I won't. So with that, let me turn it over to Herb Lynn. Thanks. So. <laughs> did I screw up? Oh, I, I did screw up. OK, there we go. OK. So thanks. Uh, great to, to be here. For those of you who were um, at the at lunch today, um, my, my apologies. It's the same view graphs, different stories perhaps, but same view graphs. So my job here is to talk a little bit about the fundamental underlying technology here. It's to, to give you some idea of the the basics, the the real the nuts and bolts of, of what's going on. It's not a very technical thing, but it's the, the technical dimension of this is different in, in many ways than uh, what one might be used to if you think about tr more traditional kinetic operations. This is the one-slide version of cyber policy. Everything you needed to know on one slide. Uh, we depend on, as, as Darrell pointed out, we depend on information technology for both military and civilian purposes. Therefore, we have to defend it. Cybersecurity is what you do to defend it, to protect it. Okay? There's a defensive aspect to it and an offensive aspect to it. The defensive aspect is something that lots of people talk about, but it's inadequate. The offensive side of it is very hush-hush, not talked about at all. Uh, on the defensive side, there are basically two things you can do. You can buy better antivirus programs. All of you should be running antivirus programs on your computers, all of you should have firewalls, all that kind of thing, good passwords, all that, that, that stuff. Those are called what you call passive defenses. And if you get into trouble, you can call the cops, okay? And then they tell you, get in line, because they've got a lot of other people to worry about, too. So all of that's inadequate. And so it's natural to start thinking about the offensive dimension of it, how much you strike back. Uh, make somebody who's attacking pay a penalty of some sort. Um, but it's not discussed at all publicly for a variety of, of reasons. For example, the recent Defense Department strategy on cyberspace doesn't at all acknowledge the role of offensive operations. Once you have offensive operational capability, you can use them for non-defensive purposes. You can use them to further your own national interests. So if you've heard of Stuxnet, is anybody, how many people have heard of Stuxnet? Okay, so Stuxnet is a uh, computer worm that has attacked Iranian centrifuges that are used to produce enriched uranium for nuclear weapons. And there are some reports that it says that it's set it back by five, you know, three years. You hear various estimates of it. Nobody knows who did it. Nobody knows who's responsible for it. There are a lot of theories. Nobody knows for certain who's responsible for it. <clears throat> but it was clearly a cyber attack against uh, Iran. 
these are the this is the fundamental of fundamentals of the offensive of, of offensive operations. And by the way, these slides I'm going to send along to Daryl if you if you give him your email address and he'll distribute them to anybody who wants them. There are three elements to an offensive operation. There's access, a vulnerability, and a payload. And it's probably let me give you an example of it. You have a let's say you have a file cabinet, okay, uh, and there's information in there, papers in it. What are you going to do with it? You want to get at it. You're the, you're the enemy. You want to get inside that, that file cabinet. Access is where is the file cabinet? It's one thing if it's in my office. It's another thing if it's in a bank. It's another thing if it's in a police station. It's a different thing if it's in the, uh, in, in, on the space station. Okay. Vulnerability is how strong that lock is on the file cabinet. Is it, does it have three pins, four pins, six pins? Does it have two locks, one lock? Is it made of thin sheet metal, or is it very, th or are the walls very thick? There are vulnerabilities there to be taken advantage of. Okay, and the payload is what you want to do. That is, once you get inside the file cabinet, you have these papers. What do you want to do? You want to shred them. You can destroy the data. You want to just photocopy them and put them back. That's stealing information. That's espionage. Do you want to alter the data on it so you erase something and then you write some a new number on uh, on certain pages and and so on? That's compromising the integrity of the data. Uh, do you want to um, pour ink all over the paper so that uh, the other guy can't read the paper? That's denial of service. Right? So there are various things that you can do. Um, you can use, you can accomplish these methods, the, these these ends, by using both technical and social means. That is, it's not just hacking, computer hacking. It is bribing a secretary. So that's another aspect of, of, of offensive, taking offensive operations. So when you talk about access, let me talk a little bit about all, the, all three of those. Access, there's remote, which is doing it at a distance, sort of roughly over the internet, right? Or maybe you have a Wi-Fi connection on an internet, on a, on a local area network that doesn't talk to the internet, but there's a Wi-Fi <laughs> connection on it, you can get access to that. Uh, and there are various things that you can do once you have this kind of, of uh, remote access. But there's also close, there's also close uh, access, which is you get up close to the computer. So probably some of you bought your computer's mail order. They appear in your, you know, at, at home, right? How do you know that somebody didn't open up the box while it was on a loading dock and swap in, put in some software? Okay, I bought my computer that way. Maybe somebody did it to me. How do I know that somebody didn't open it up and put in a new chip somewhere? Or while I was talking over here, somebody put in a USB drive that I don't know about and loaded some software onto this. Well, actually, I was watching my computer. But you know, there, not, not everybody would, would do that. And, and you know, so that's another way of, of getting it. An infected USB drive is the way, it is one way that the Stuxnet virus could have gotten into the Iranian networks, which were not connected to the internet. Um, and so there are various ways of getting access that require you to get close up. <coughs> there's vulnerabilities galore. There's crummy software. There's hardware that can be tampered with. There are communications channels that uh, you broadcast. If you use Wi-Fi, sometimes you're, you connect to an unencrypted link, and it's at your computer, at least mine, tells you you're about to communicate over an unencrypted link. Other people could see your information. You sure you want to do this? There's the system configuration. Sometimes the system comes with default passwords. You can look up default passwords on the internet for most routers, for example. <coughs> I've done it. You can do it too. And you can probably crack 30% of the routers you come across with just by knowing those default passwords. Uh, and people don't change them. Why? Because they're lazy. Okay. There's many ways of getting access. You can compromise the users. You can blackmail them. You can bribe them. You can get at the manufacturer that you can persuade the CEO. You can persuade the CEO to do something, especially if you're about to give. If you're a, if you're a government and you want to give this guy a contract, you say, "Well, if you're going to, you we're going to give you lots of business in the future if you cooperate with us." And the cooperation is, "Well, you make antivirus programs, and well, maybe you want to ignore the following virus if it ever if you ever see it." Right? It's a possibility. I don't know that this has ever been done, but it's certainly within the realm of possibility. Uh, you can get at communications channels. You can monitor a Wi-Fi signal. Uh, you can sometimes there's a modem that's attached to a computer, uh, a telephone connection to a computer that shouldn't be there, but it's there anyway. 
Um, sometimes somebody goes into a closet that's outside and hooks up a Wi-Fi router that nobody knows is there, and they broadcast it. In fact, at home, I have a, I used to carry it around, I don't do it anymore, I have a little device about this big that turns any computer into a Wi-Fi broadcast station. So if I slip it onto the computer in your office and put it in back so that you never see it, it just becomes a Wi-Fi link, and now I can listen in on your conversations just by walking down the hall. It's all kinds of interesting ways of, of, of getting this. You can go after service providers, uh, service providers who do virus uh, checking, for example. Um, you can plant the mole inside a, uh, a manufacturer, all sorts of things you can do. <coughs> what can you do once you're inside? As I talked about, you can steal information or you can compromise it. You can alter it. You can make it unavailable to, to other people. Uh, you can pretend that, that it comes from someone else. And all of those are, those three things, compromises of integrity and authenticity and availability, those are usually called attack. They degrade, disrupt, destroy information or a computer system. Um, exploitation is when you steal information. It's not stealing in the usual sense. If I steal your wallet, you don't have it anymore, right? I have your money, you don't. But if I steal your social security number, I have it and you have it too. That's why you don't know that you've, that you've lost your social security number because you haven't actually lost it you still know what it is, right? That's part of what makes the whole business so interesting. <coughs> Excuse me. Both attacks and exploitations use the same technical means. If there's something that happens to your computer, you don't know whether it's an exploit or an attack, right? What happened? I don't know. And it's very hard to know. By the way, it's the, the press also can't distinguish them. To them, everything is a cyber attack. But if you look up cyber attack, <coughs> What it almost always is an exploitation. That is, somebody has lost information or has compromised information. And key characteristics of these things. Okay. What can you do? Well, sometimes you're not interested in the computer. You're interested in the generator that's connected to the computer, so you try to kill the computer, so you kill the generator. The generator is the thing you wanted. Right? And so what that means is that since you can connect anything to the computer, the indirect effects really matter a lot. And indirect doesn't mean not primary. A friend of mine says, electrons don't wear uniforms in cyberspace. That means that it's his fancy way of saying that it's anonymous in cyberspace. An operation is anonymous. You don't know who attacked you. You, could, you may have some clues, but it's very hard to know with high degree of confidence who attacked you just on the basis of, of, of technical signatures. Sometimes the bad guy makes a mistake that you can exploit. You can figure out who, who attacked you. But it's hard. The technology is here, right? You can buy, get it at Best Buy. You can get it mail order. You can download hacking kits on the internet. So what this means is that since the technology, offensive technology is available to everyone, it means that even non-state actors, small players, can create some of the effects that it previously took big players to, to, to accomplish, to, 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 to do. Okay. And they can be companies, they can be individuals, they can be criminals, they can be terrorists, they can be organized crime. They can all get this stuff too. If you're poor, you can steal money on the internet. Lots of, lots of people stealing money on the internet. And what do you do with that money? You can buy more resources. You can pay programmers to, to, to do things for you and, and, and so on. Uh, and so you can also steal computing resources. So I can steal your computer or the use of your computer for a little while and make it do what I want. And you'll never know that you've done it. You can do cyber attacks on a broad scale or on a narrow scale. That is, they can be narrowly targeted. Stuxnet was something that was aimed only at centrifuges operated by Siemens control systems. Okay. Nothing else. It was only attack, and it went, it touched a lot of other computers, but it didn't do anything bad to them. It was targeted only at, at systems that had, that had centrifuges, uh, certain centrifuges run by Siemens control systems. Um, or you could have a very broad attack that just targets everybody indiscriminately. Here the lesson is, the more precise you want to be, the harder it is. The more expensive it is, the more intelligence you need, and, and, and so on. Longer lead times. <coughs> and cyber operations are really hard to plan. Very, very complex. More so than traditional military operations. Many more options. 
you can, sometimes your attack can be only used once. So you attack and the other guy fixes it, fixes the problem, fixes the vulnerability that you took advantage of, and now you can't use that anymore. So it means you have to use a different method of attacking if you want to attack him again. And you may run out of that. You may run out of different ways of going after him. Uh, it may be temporarily limited in effect by design. Uh, there's a new ver variant of Stuxnet that's going around now that disappears after 36 days. It turns itself off and deletes itself. Uh, it can be limited in scope. It can be hard to execute on the fly. If there's a target that pops up and you don't know anything about it and you haven't done any preparation to gather intelligence, you're going to be hard pressed to conduct a cyber attack on it. Uh, and these guys are, are fast. They can, they, people often talk about them as they're being very fast. You press a button, it goes at the speed of light. Yeah, that's true. But there are a lot of other considerations. There's the planning, there's the policy issues, there's the legal issues. In practice, over time, historically over the last 10, 15 years or so, the speed of a cyber attack has been governed by law, not by the speed of transmission. It operates at the speed of law, not at the speed of light. How do you use offensive operations to defend yourself? Well, you could do it before he attacks. You can get early warning. You can know that he's got about to uh, th that he's uh, about to attack you. How do you do that? You have to be in his computer system watching him generate the attack. That means you have to be you have to penetrate his system. Maybe you have to preempt. You can preempt him. Maybe you can, can destroy his computer systems before he's able to destroy yours, to, to attack yours. I mean, you could do that. During an attack, by the way, we've announced that we're willing to do this, uh, we can attack the computers that are attacking us so that we can disrupt the attack in progress. Uh, and afterwards, we ha may have to conduct forensic operations to go after the guys that are attacking us to s just to see who they were. So what happens is that there's a computer, you go back one computer, and you look at that computer, and it finds out that that was compromised by another guy, who was compromised by another guy, who was compromised by another guy. You've got to go through all of those guys to go all the way back to find out who is the ultimate, who is ultimately responsible. Um, and th that takes offensive capability. And maybe you want to conduct retaliation to discourage further attacks. How might you use these offensive capabilities to do non-defensive operations? Okay? So these are illustrative. I'm not advocating any of them. But for example, you could use them to kill an adversary's air defense so that your bombers can go through without being shot down. You could destroy their electric grid because that you might want to do that because their, that their electric grid supplies the Ministry of Defense. You might want to disrupt their elections. So you can see why I'm not advocating this, right? I'm not saying this is a good thing to do, but it's a matter of record that the United States has wanted to influence, public, influence elections in other countries before. One way to do that would be to go after an electronic voting system uh, to hack that. You could disrupt adversary research and development. Um, or productions of, uh, production of weapons of mass destruction. Or you could steal information from them. You could get their negotiating positions for tre in treaty negotiations. You can get their political plans. You can get valuable commercial information. Okay. What, their, what, their company, what, are, what are these companies doing? Uh, in, what are certain companies doing to get their trade secrets and, and the like? As a matter of policy, the United States does not do this to other nations. We do not collect intelligence to gather information economic information for the purpose of gaining economic advantage. Okay. That's a matter of policy. Every other nation in the world does this. We don't. A couple of observations and then I'll, I'll, a few observations, then I'll turn it over to um, Martin. First is that we haven't seen anything yet. That is, this is all still very new. And many forms of offensive operations just haven't appeared yet. So. What we see in co conflict in cyberspace is going to be very different in the future uh, than what we've seen in the past. Stuxnet, a lot of people talked about it. It was a wake-up call to the policy community. The approach is generally applicable. The specific code is not, at least not the payload side of it. Um, but it was not a wake-up call for the technical community. Everyone in the technical community knew that something like Stuxnet was possible. There's a paradox, and there's another paradox in cyberspace, which is that it's very hard to do good defense. So people say, then we have to think about deterrence, preventing the other, making the other guy, dissuading the other guy from attacking. But then when you look at, think about cyber deterrence, you come back and say, that's really hard, so we need to do better defense. 
right? So we have to do good deterrence. We can't do good defense. We have to do deterrence. And you can't do deterrence because we don't know how to do that. So we have to do good defense. And if you think that's unsatisfactory, you're right. Okay? Nobody knows how to square, you know, to, to, to get around that. I'd argue that there are many forces driving us towards offensive uh, operations for non-defensive purposes. Uh, that that's the only thing left to do because the offensive operations that you conduct can't really protect your own technology, despite what the claims are by the by various people within the <laughs> defense establishment. And cy cyber is not separate from other f other conflict domains, right? The, that you can you have a wide range of tools at your disposal to respond. You can respond in kinetic space. You can respond diplomatically through law enforcement, economically, a variety of things you can, you can do. And the last thing I want to point out in all of this is that there's a lot of secrecy about this, which clouds the discussion. And that's really, really, really problematic. That's part of why we did these two reports. These are reports that are available for free on the internet. Um, do a search on those terms, uh, and you'll get the free. P you'll be taken to free PDFs of them. Um, and I'm happy to answer any questions uh, later on. Contact information there. Blah blah blah. Um, Martin. Thank you for your applause, and you don't even know what I'm about to say. <laughs> um, once I had the opportunity to talk to a retired Israeli general, we were talking about Stuxnet. Now, Stuxnet is a bit of a paradox. If you ask the question, how much did it set back the Iranian nuclear program? Because when IISS took a look at the number of centrifuges <coughs> that were destroyed, it was about 10%. Uh, and the Iranians managed to recover that in about a six-month time period. And yet, you had all these estimates that said that Iran was set back three years. So I talked to the guy. I said, look, you had this wonderful Stuxnet. Didn't seem to have done you a whole lot of good now, did it? And he said, maybe yes, and maybe no. He says, it may have done more good than it looks. I said, what do you mean? He said, and obviously I'm not quoting him exactly since it was a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. But he said, look at it this way. Right now, Iran is producing 3% uranium. If they're going to get to a bomb, they're going to have to produce 90% uranium. Once they get past a certain threshold, everybody in the rest of the world gets excited because they have to kick out the IEA, International Atomic Energy Agency, inspectors. At that point, Iran has to start running a gauntlet, right? They've got to get to where they have a bomb before the rest of the world community comes down on them like a ton of bricks. Now. If Iran made the calculation, it's only going to take me about, say, three to four months to go from 3% to a bomb. That may be a gauntlet they can run. But what if Iran is not entirely certain they can do it? What if they're not entirely certain because they don't know that they've cleaned Stuxnet out of their system, right? It's very easy to tell that you're infected. It's very, very difficult to tell that you're not infected. So what if you had this aura of, and I'm going to use the term magic here. Right? You remember Arthur C. Clarke's dictum, any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic? Well, I'd like to offer the proposition that cyber war is probably as close we're going to come to magic and conflict as we have in a long time. It's, it's mysterious, not because it isn't ultimately at the point mathematics, and of course mathematics by definition is completely transparent, but it's mysterious because its mystery lies in the complexity of the systems that we attack. For any halfway defended system, and I'm being very liberal in the use of the word halfway, a system can only be attacked if there are flaws in the system, if there are vulnerabilities in the system. Now, if your system were simple, you could pretty much guarantee, with reasonableness and even some mathematical proofs, that in fact the system is flawless. But as we know now today, computer systems are increasingly complex, and every year they become more and more complex. Not only is the software more complex, but the aggregation of things that we put together in networks also becomes complex, right? Now, what happens is, the only reason I can attack you is because I know that you have a flaw in your system, or I believe you have a flaw in your system that you yourself are unaware of. Now notice, by the way, that's a very high bar in knowledge. I've got to know more, at least something about your system that you don't know about. Well, why don't you know about it? Again, it's because of that complexity, right? If I knew my systems were not infected, 
I would also know enough about my systems that my systems couldn't be infected. But in fact, we don't have that level of knowledge, precisely because of, the, of that notion. Now, so what we have is a world in which people have a certain level of concern and fear, but fear is the wrong word, as I, as I will demonstrate in a moment, okay, about what their, how penetrable their systems are. Um, now, why do I say fear is the wrong word? You're maybe all familiar with the acronym fear, uncertainty, and doubt, which is usually said in one breath as one word as if it were the same thing. But in fact, it's not. Because if you take a look about nuclear weapons, you're talking about a world of fear. You're talking about a world of almost somatic uh, response to the fear of nuclear weapons. But if you talk about cyber weapons, you're really in the realm of doubt. You're really in the realm of lack of cognitive knowledge, right? If I had a nuclear bomb and I was threatening you, you would have no doubt about the efficacy of that device, particularly if I demonstrated it before. But if I had a cyber weapon and I was threatening you, you might have a great deal of doubt about the integrity of your own systems. Or you might have no doubt at all. Which gets into a somewhat of a, a paradox. And the, and the world of cyber war is nothing if not replete with paradoxes, OK? If I demonstrate a capability, I may be adding to my ability to deter all sorts of actions on your part. But at the same time, I might be reducing it. If you think I'm 10 feet tall, and I go to a large amount of trouble to demonstrate I'm eight feet tall, what have I really done in the world of deterrence? And the answer is, well, maybe I haven't done myself any favors here. Maybe I've sort of gotten rid of the magic. And what you actually want is to maintain the notion of magic in the other side's mind, OK? Now, that's offensive. Let me talk a little bit about defensive and turn the problem back on itself. I've been in this business more or less kind of for 15 to 20 years thereabout. And when I was at the National Defense University, I had a good colleague of mine, Colonel Allard, who said the first rule of information warfare is do not do it to yourself. I thought it was pretty wise on our part, right? So let's think about deterrence. Magic is what the United States does to other countries, right? Or is it what we do to ourselves? For instance, if you were the Secretary of Defense, you wouldn't dare deter yourself by worrying about a cyber Pearl Harbor. You wouldn't dare deter yourself and to demonstrate that the United States can, in fact, be dissuaded by saying how easy it is, how probable it is, for somebody to take down the national infrastructure. And yet we do it all the time. Yet we do it all the time because we ourselves are a little uncertain about cyber war. It's almost axiomatic to say that whatever cyber war happens, it'll be something we didn't predict. Give you an example from the news of about a week or so ago. There was an article in the New York Times <coughs> saying that US military planners had thought that it might be a good idea to carry out cyber war against Libya's air defense systems, only to realize that you can't exactly flip that button, right? If I've got a nuclear bomb and I built it for Germany and Germany just happened to have quit the war, I can always use it for Japan, right? Nice target set. You can't do that for cyber because the vulnerabilities in the systems you're going after have to be discovered. As it turns out, unless the other guy's really stupid at his infrastructure, and you, you never, count, never count out other people's stupidity. They may always give you an opportunity. Generally speaking, as Herb suggested, it's going to take a while to find that vulnerability. So <laughs> it's like, OK, give me six months, and I'll get into Libyan's air defenses. And you're the kinetic guy, and you're saying, Excuse me, but in a week, I'll probably have all that stuff down, you know, down to the ground anyhow. Who are you guys trying to impress? Which, by the way, is not a bad question for cyber war. Okay? Now, this business of magic, I could go on and on, but in, 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 deference, in deference to the length of the conference and in deference to my general lack of sleep, I just want to end on, on the following note. About 30 years ago, I got into this war business. I started working in the Department of the Navy, and I quickly learned that if you wanted to be serious in talking about war, you had to sprinkle in some German words. <laughs> Blitzkrieg was good. There are others I've seen, you know, fingertip control. There's a German equivalent for that, right? That showed you were really a serious student of war. One of the problems in cyber war, however, is we haven't had a whole lot of German. <laughs> Part of the problem is that the word cyber in German translates into, ready, cyber. Because <laughs> actually, it's a Greek word. Um, and I really miss this. So I'm going to coin now a German word for cyber war. First thing I want to do is I want to capture the notion that a lot of what concerns us is really not war, right? We're concerned about countries, e.g. China, 
uh, overtaking us in an economic race because they're stealing all of our intellectual property. They're concerned about us destabilizing the Chinese state because we, we will not shut off dissident groups that broadcast from the United States into, in, into China. By the way, these are serious concerns in both of our, 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 our countries. And if you try to negotiate about cyber war, you realize pretty quickly you're talking about two different things, which kind of makes negotiations a little more difficult than you might have hoped. At any rate, so I decided the word <coughs> struggle was a much better idea. And it transitions in German and, of course, into Kampf. If you, if you speak German, you know my pronunciation isn't that good, but I'll do what I can. But what do we do for the first word? And it turns out there's a very nice word called Zauber. How many of you are familiar with Zauberflaut? Mozart's a magic flute, right? And it sounds similar to cyber, but it really means magic. So there you have. I'm going to put a trademark on the term Zauberkampf. And for that, I will turn to you. <laughs> Well, thanks very much. Uh, Martin, you couldn't have set me up better because I wanted to say something quickly about uh, the word cyber. And uh, it, it is a very strange word. Uh, it's only recently, in the past couple of years, that we started to use it as a standalone word. Uh, it's always been a bound prefix in words like cyberspace, cyber war, cyber attack, or the older idea of, of cybernetics. Um, and really, the best translation is control. It comes to us from the Greek word kuberman, which means uh, to steer or to pilot a boat. It's the same root as government. Um, and, uh, and once you start thinking about it in that term, I think that uh, um, it, it'll help us to, to, to get uh, a, a little ways. Um, cyber as an independent word has only really emerged in the last couple of years as the Department of Defense has started talking about it as a, another <coughs> domain, an independent domain for conflict, which is separate from the natural domains of sea, space, land, and the air. Um, and uh, this may make some sense uh, when you have to run a bureaucracy and you need to separate budgets and make sure people are trained. Um, but it's a little strange, actually, to, to think about in this way uh, because uh, computers and communications and control systems are the things that allow military forces to do anything at all in any of these other actual domains. So you can't operate in the sea, on the land, um, or in the air unless you can actually uh, connect planes with their headquarters and one another, uh, and if they're able to see their adversaries, so on and so forth. So this is fundamentally an integrated control technology which makes, makes it possible to do all other sorts of military operations. Um, but now we started talking about uh, the idea of operating cyber. We have U.S. Cyber Command that is going to, you know, command and control cyber offense and defense in this area. So how can we think about this? Um, prior to the stand-up of U.S. Cyber Command, the, probably the biggest advocate in the U.S. government for thinking about it this way was the U.S. Air Force. You might remember they had a slogan, Air, Space, and Cyberspace. Uh, they were running commercials and whatnot. Uh, the Navy's also been a big proponent. And uh, it should be telling that it's the Navy and the Air Force, the two most technologically sophisticated services that have really been started to bang the drum about cyber when it's been the Army and the Marine Corps that have actually been engaged in two hot wars um, uh, in Iraq and Afghanistan. So um, here we are talking a lot about cyber at a point that we're drawing down, defense budgets are shrinking uh, and, and whatnot. So what is the prognosis for uh, cyber as an independent weapon? Well, I think it's instructive actually to think about the Air Force um, and thinking about technology as an independent weapon because this was a service that was actually built around an innovation, the aircraft, um, and the argument that this could be an independent weapon to fight, uh, at least fight wars differently and perhaps even win them uh, without the help of the other services. Uh, but when this theory was put into practice, uh, it ran into a couple of, of challenges. So uh, the, the original ambitions kind of came in two flavors. And uh, one was uh, uh, an idea that if you attacked, if you flew over the battlefield, didn't engage forces at all, went all the way home and started bombing civilian targets, uh, you would cause such panic uh, and uh, dispiriting uh, situation that the populace would beg their leaders to stop the war. It would just be so bad. Uh, that there would be a complete loss of morale. Uh, the other theory was, well, this is a way to break the economic infrastructure and break the war-making uh, potential of the adversary's country so they wouldn't be actually be able to, to wage war on the battlefield. Fair enough, let's go ahead and try this in the Second World War. 
um, the, uh, the British discovered quite quickly that it was actually difficult to operationalize. Uh, they had pretty good intelligence on what the uh, German economy looked like. They had target folders on lots of uh, uh, juicy economic targets, uh, but they found it was actually quite difficult to uh, get bombers uh, into the location and deliver their weapons. They were so inaccurate that uh, the, the British uh, decided to start bombing at, uh, excuse me, they were so unprotected, they were getting shot down, they started bombing at night. Uh, Therefore, they were just aiming for cities, hoping that they would hit factories within them. When the Americans showed up, they were a little more accurate. They were only missing by a couple of miles rather than entire cities. Um, but still, that was a long learning process before Americans realized that bombers could not escort themselves. They were getting just mobbed and shot down um, uh, with great loss of life uh, by German air defenses. Uh, so not until uh, escort fighters were starting to be long-range escort fighters were produced uh, in, in enough quantities um, were American bombers able to, to deliver the punch. But even then, um, they found that it was very difficult. Found that when you bomb an adversary's population, they don't give up, they actually get angry. And this is an experiment that's been run over and over again uh, against the United States with Pearl Harbor and 9-11, um, with the United States against Serbia. We found people don't like getting bombed. That intends to redouble their resolve to resist. Furthermore, uh, economies actually tend to be fairly resilient. Uh, the British economy took a pounding and yet um, ended up producing more war material uh, at the height of the Allied bombing than before it. Uh, they found all kinds of synthetics to uh, use when uh, oil stocks were depleted, uh, different ways to produce ball bearings and, and whatnot. Um, so, uh, so the original theory didn't work out too well, but that doesn't mean that, I mean, this was a, this was a very costly campaign, but it doesn't mean that it was useless. It did a couple of very good things. Uh, probably the best thing that uh, this did for the Allied war effort was it sucked off um, uh, uh, the German Air Force uh, so that uh, Allied ground forces really didn't have to deal with the German air threat that they might have otherwise. And this it's undeniably created a great deal of friction in the German war machine, both in the war economy and in the command and control. So, there, uh, so the idea of winning independently turned out not to work so well, uh, but there was this supportive friction injection role that uh, strategic bombing could play. Fast forward to today, um, I think that actually uh, some of those considerations are fairly independent of the technology uh, involved. We're talking about you know, using a technology to bypass fighting altogether, uh, to attack critical infrastructure, uh, and to make war uh, uh, cheaper and easier somehow than it otherwise would be. Um, I would argue for you know, much the same reason that uh, the two previous speakers talked about, because this is such a complex uh, technology, there's a great deal of ambiguity, uh, it is both harder we're not sure how adversaries are going to react, but there are these interesting supporting roles uh, that, that cyber uh, operations can play. Uh, and we've, ta we've talked a lot about uh, uh, several of these, um, but just to run over them real quickly, uh, uh, the use of, of cyber for intelligence is a huge boon. Um, it's possible now to uh, exfiltrate you know, gigabytes of data that would have been very, very risky and cost uh, lots of planning and uh, you know, putting lots of agent, risk at li uh, agent lives at risk during the Cold War. So that's a lot easier. That can um, help to uh, improve one's relations against adversary over the long run. The whole self-theft of intellectual property and other information resources, um, uh, whether it be wealth itself, whether it be negotiating positions, and other support <laughs> sorts of uh, informational resources can perhaps over the, the long term uh, alter the balance of power between uh, countries. Um, I think there is a whole host of very interesting uh, uh, operations that more resemble covert special operations than actual, you know, big war fighting. Uh, and Stuxnet um, is, is, might be a good example. Things that take a lot of planning, uh, that are very target specific and, uh, you know, are really sort of an in and out thing, but might not have you know large scale strategic effects, but you know are, are part of the ongoing game that you know great powers tend to play. Great powers are you know just constantly involved in finding ways to make things uh, dicey and frictive for one another without crossing those red lines that cause wars uh, that would be too costly for either of them to fight anyway. Um, and lastly, uh, again, also in the, the covert action. Um, uh, uh, category, but you know, there's also an overt side. I think this whole notion of uh, influencing uh, populations and affecting regime stability from the inside is something that we see a number of uh, different states uh, interested in in very different flavors. So um, I'll, I'll leave it there so we can open up for discussion. But you know, bottom line, um, 
uh, you know, there are precedents for thinking about the most frightening and most dangerous scenarios that get the most press in the news, but there's good reasons to be very suspicious that that would actually be useful in any kind of a strategic operation. And yet at the same time, I think the playbook for intelligence, irregular warfare, covert operations is very interestingly expanded by this technology. So I have to say that was absolutely terrific. The three panelists did a great job kicking off this discussion. Um, I want to get to uh, questions from the audience pretty quickly, but um, let me let me try to get kind of the discussion and maybe arguments between you guys going um, by raising a couple questions. I'll do them one at a time, um, but I'll only do a couple questions and see if I can get reactions, and then after that I'll, I'll take questions from the audience. So question number one <laughs> is this, which is um, I'm having a hard time figuring out myself whether fundamentally, when we think about the weapon side of cyber things, as opposed to the espionage, when we think about the weapon side of cyber things, are these fundamentally <coughs> weapons of the strong or weapons of the weak? Now, with a first cut through it, we all could know all the ar arguments why these might fundamentally be weapons of the weak, very low barriers to entry, right? And in our kind of Jack Bauer kind of fantasies, you know, two disgruntled guys in their underwear in Kazakhstan, you know, doing untold amounts of damage across the eastern seaboard or something like that. Because, again, low barriers to entry, a, you know, a couple people with some good technical <coughs> skills and an internet connection can, as, uh, as Herb said, steal resources, get controls of more computing power, do a lot of damage. Okay, I understand that story. On the other hand, what we also learned from the three of you guys and from other discussions that we've had <coughs> is that a really serious cyber attack against a, a serious kind of infrastructure, a target that's been defended, is going to require a lot of planning a big intelligence network to figure out the specific vulnerabilities, social as well as technical vulnerabilities in that network. It's going to require a big coding effort. It's going to require maybe a whole range of these cyber weapons to be used in sequence, because each weapon would only work maybe against a single target. And then once you've used it once, they're going to fix those holes. And so I think about that, and I think maybe this really is you know, a weapon of the strong. And when John was just talking about sea, space, air, and ground as kind of domains of warfare, I think, well, the United States dominates the sea, the air, and the space. Not so much, not as much the ground. Those are the areas of where technology rules, like, like this one. And then lastly, it occurred to me that if I was an Iranian sitting here, <laughs> I'd be offended. I'd be like, there's all this talk about the danger of cyber warfare and the threats to the United States. And I'd say, for God's sake, the only ones who we think did this ever was either you or one of your friends. So maybe this isn't this weapon of the weak. Maybe this is a weapon of the strong. And what's the, what's the big concern here? <coughs> Any or all of you? Why does it have to be either or? Well, who's it principally? Why does it have to be principally? I mean, it, it, the, the, the argument that I would make here is, is that cyber attack is a methodology. Sorry. Um, and, and it's like having a chemical explosive. Um, you have chemical explosives in a gun you know, in a pistol, and you have chemical explosives in blockbuster bombs that weigh, you know, 10,000, you know, that are 10,000 pounds heavy. Um, and and that's, uh, that's a lot. Uh, and, and, but they're completely different in different scenarios. So uh, I don't know that it has to be principally one or principally the other. It's just a, it's a way of achieving something. I have a colleague of mine who has a three-stage plan for carrying out cyber war against the Taliban. Step one, teach him to read. Step two, sell them computers. Step three, you can probably guess. Um, cyber weapons are unique. Now, let me give you a contrast. If I have a gun and you don't have a gun, I'm in a better position. If I have a ship and you don't have a ship, I'm in a better position. If I have a plane and you don't have a plane, I'm in a better position. It's also true for spacecraft. But if I've got a computer and a hacker and you don't have a computer, I'm not in a better position. Because you have, you have to get at some level of development before you're even vulnerable to that. But ha so I would say it's not a matter of the strong versus the weak or the weak versus the strong. It's a matter of the elite versus the naive. Let me give you another example here, OK? There are a lot of countries that use weapons that they don't have the capability of manufacturing <coughs> because they don't have the sophistication infrastructure. They buy a lot of weapons from folks. Now, <clears throat> if I take an F-16, and it happens to be in the hands of, of an underdeveloped country, chances are they won't use it as 
in as, as sophisticated a way as the U.S. Air Force is, would. Chances are they won't maintain it as well as the U.S. Air Force would, okay? They won't integrate it as well. But it's still a fearsome war weapon. But if I, you have a network and I have hackers, I can turn that network into a negative weapon. I can make you worse off for having gone to the trouble of having that network because you haven't, you haven't matched the sophistication of your network management to the sophistication of the technology that you're using for it. Now, you could abjure networks altogether, in which case you're invulnerable to certain attacks, okay? Or you could buy networks and have the sophistication to protect them and the wisdom to figure out what you put on a network and what you don't. But where you don't want to be is having enough money to buy the networks and enough sophistication to know how to protect them. And that's when you're vulnerable. Um, I, I'm going to come down and say that this is a weapon of the strong against the weak. Um, and I, I think that you know the use of IT in all sectors of society has been to enhance control, precision, and the ability to uh, manage uncertainty and ambiguity. Uh, um, there's a great book called The Control Revolution by James Benninger. He wrote it back in 86 before the internet kicked off. But his argument was that the information society is not a new thing that um, you know Apple invented. Um, this is something that has been part and parcel of the Industrial Revolution and increasing abilities to control things, the challenges of controlling the controls, and the growth of bureaucracy, communications, uh, computers. All of these things have gone together and they have greatly advan advantaged large corporations and large states, which incidentally are you know, the prime drivers and you know, innovation of kind of a lot of the core infrastructures uh, in these things. Um, so uh, I think that in order for it to be a weapon of the weak, the strong really has to pull its punches and agree to do something uh, you know, like we do in Iraq, where you say, well, we're very interested in building uh, this this, uh, a new state that looks something like a democracy, but at least you know is, is somewhat functioning. It's going to have these various liberal uh, institutions. In order to do that, we're going to have to uh, abide by a lot of laws. You're going to abide by some of those laws, so we're going to facilitate the insurgents' ability to hide within the population and exploit some of those rules that we have voluntarily uh, agreed to, to follow. So um, you've already kind of raised the bar into a higher level of control than all out, you know, we're swapping territory and trying to figure out, um, you know, just kind of what is the rough state of ownership of what's going on. Uh, Let me throw one kind of question, one last question on the table, and then I want to open up. Um, for the people here. So again, so the kind of the root cause, I think, of the concerns at the, not in, among cyber experts who think about it because that's what they do for a living, but for folks who are focused on US national security. Why should in a day of austerity and scarce defense dollars, why should I be funded? So one is this notion that it may, might give asymmetric advantages to the weak and hence, you know, it's gonna really require a lot of our efforts. The other one though has to do with something that you guys touched on quickly about the problems of attribution. <coughs> And the problem of attribution, me meaning that it's difficult to determine after an act who was the source of it, unwinds many of our, the, the ways that we like to deter nasty events and respond to them afterwards. And again, the initial first cut kind of logic of it makes a lot of sense, which is through means that require many more IQ points than I have, people could take over servers around the world, far away from where they're located and run attacks from them, et cetera, so I understand that. The question is this. Is it, if, if somebody does enough damage with a cyber attack, um, and I don't know what enough is, a substantial amount of damage um, against a powerful country, the United States or Great Britain or Russia or, or whomever, um, and that country were motivated to, to, to devote the serious resources of a powerful state to figure out who did this. Do you think, and by who I mean where, where it came from, do you think that's just, there's just technical reasons why they're never going to get there? Or do you think that using the various tools that you guys understand better than I, as well as the general intelligence tools, <laughs> the policing tools, that, that, that again, the reason attribution is hard is that the attacks have been pinpricks. And if the attacks weren't pinpricks, attribution would start getting done. So, what's the, the question? So the, the question is, is the attribution problem really a fundamental difficult problem in this, or does it only appear to be because the attacks have been pinpricks and annoyances and espionage? Because if attribution is not a huge problem, then all the normal tolls of US national security policy and statecraft seem to apply. We go to war even when there's zero attribution. 
So, okay, we did, we, we yeah. did that for in, in Iraq. That's right. Um, we, there was no evidence at all that they were responsible for the 9-11 attacks. And we went after them for that anyway, um, and so on. So the, the, the level, so it's not clear that the level of attribution actually is significant in, you know, in, in any decision to, to, to attack somebody. But I mean, you, you raise an interesting point. I think you, you're saying is, if it were a very serious attack, wouldn't we devote more resources to finding out who it was, uh, who was responsible, uh, and then hold them accountable? I think that's basically your question, right? And, and if you can do that, then and can you use the normal tools of statecraft to deter and to punish? And so, to well, so for example, if, if you were the victim of a very serious cyber attack, and let's say it was launched by a state, it would be an interesting question as to whether or not that state could keep it secret. Okay. So you have your spies and you have your communications intercepts and all those other sorts of tools that you can't, that you can't figure out who it was from the technical signature, from examining the hard disk that they penetrate, you know, and that, that sort of stuff. But maybe you have other intelligence. Maybe you have a spy that's well placed. Maybe you overhear a couple of conversations between the senior general staffs or something like that. Um, and we get a lot like that. We, we get a lot of information through those kinds of, of channels. So it, I think it's it's a red herring to say that really attribution is impossible. It's just that it's very uncertain. What uncertain means is maybe you know maybe you have it and maybe you don't, and it depends all on the circumstances. A very complicated question. <coughs> um, <coughs> First of all, it's not a question whether you know or not. It's a question of with what confidence do you know and with what confidence are you willing to act. And by the way, that was not the first time we went to war based on, a, a, on attribution. There I was the, it was, right. Yeah. No, I, 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 I <laughs> with you, sir. <laughs> there was the Spanish-American War, yeah. classic example of going to war against the guys who didn't do it in the end. Okay. Um, you bring up an interesting question. Uh, when it comes to, to cyber espionage from China, and I do use the word China here. Um, we know it's China. We have a lot of evidence it's China. And yet, they seem to do it anyhow. Why? Because it's considered cyber espionage and thus below the threshold. And the second reason is that often there's no harm to the actual computer. In other words, I could spy, I could, I could take information for your computer from years and you'll never know the difference. A cyber attack is going to be a lot more instant. OK, now having said as much, there are two issues here, and I'm going to address the easier one. The first issue is, does the attacker think <coughs> that he can get away with it? And the second question is, can he in fact get away with it? Hmm. Right? For a deterrence policy, you need the attacker to believe that the chances he can get away with it are fairly good. And there are other things you throw into the equation, but that's key. Now, let's turn to the other side. Is do we think, how confident can we in fact be? I would argue that the attribution is hard in a world in which we have no consequences. In a world in which we did have consequences and other people would know it, they would take a lot more time. And one of the things they would do is make sure that we were looking at somebody else. Right? There was a war game that ran, ran, ran about 15 years ago. It had a scenario. And they divided this, the, they had seven groups of people looking at the same scenario in the war game. Four of them thought China did it, three of them thought Taiwan did it as a, as a, re, as a sort of a false flag operation. That's the real world you're going to get into in such circumstances where you want to carry out an attack and not have anybody know it. Now, the political scientist, Richard Kugler comes to mind in this particular case, would say, well, you won't, wouldn't carry out a cyber attack without identifying yourself. Otherwise, what's the point? It turns out the what's the point is a real question. And, and we can go on and on about things that are the point and things that are not the point. For instance, i give you an example. If you are an advocate of a group that it is, in fact, in many countries, say, a religion. And you want to dissuade the United States from doing something against the religion, OK? You don't have to announce yourself, because it could be one of several suspects. If, on the other hand, you have two countries that are contesting over a piece of territory, and you carry out an attack, it's going to be kind of hard to hide yourself just based on context. Now. There is a lot of discussion in the technical community as to whether we can trace an attack to a particular box. And the technical community goes, nod, nod, wink, wink, we're better than you think they are. we are. I don't know. Maybe they're right, maybe they're wrong. Now, here's a couple ways to, not, <laughs> don't try this at home, guys, to carry out an attack from somebody else's box. One, free Wi-Fi. 
available at every Best Western and most public libraries. <laughs> Two, um, infect somebody else's machine and have them carry out the attack. Three, your friendly cyber cafe. By the way, all of these attacks are much harder to do from China because China has much better surveillance than we do. And number four, and this has never been done, but there's no reason why you couldn't do it. Get a phone, pay cash. Get the SIM card, pay cash. Don't leave an ID behind. Don't call your friends. That's very important. Never call your friends on a phone you're going to attack with, right? Carry out the attack, dust off your fingerprints, throw it in a garbage can in somebody in, in a different cell tower. And you're practically scot-free. Unless you have a reputation. Or unless you've been blabbing to your friends. If you've got good trade craft, your chances of getting caught are fairly low. Now, so you're back to all this other ancillary stuff. And it essentially comes down to the question of as follows. I really hate to speak algebra, so I'll try to do the best I can. Are you more afraid of being wrong than you're afraid of not, not going ahead when you're right? Multiply by the probabilities of both of them. And if the answer is yes, it becomes a strategic decision. It is not a legal decision. Uh, I, I largely agree with, with both of these, both, both, both Herb and Martin. Um, I, I'll just say that you know it's much more risky to stick up a 7-Eleven than it is to you know remove 40 million dollars from a, a bank if you can you know uh, do that, and that's definitely been done. Um, however, you know I think a larger implication of the question you're asking is how valid are uh, analogies drawn from the domain that we have lots of experience with and that we can draw 99% of the cybersecurity examples from, which are crime, fraud, espionage, um, other you know, hijinks, um, you know, hackers showing that they've, they've done things just because they can. How valid are those intuitions about attribution, about <coughs> offense dominance, about the difficulty of detection uh, uh, when, when applied to the strategic level? Hey, let me turn this open to you guys and just take any questions you guys have. Typically on these things, we try to take questions first from students. So if there are any people who are clearly in self-identifying as students uh, and you have a question, raise your hand. No identity theft allowed. What was this? No identity theft allowed. Exactly, right. Just say, stand up, say your name and your social security number. And, then, uh, <laughs> and your mother's maiden name. All right, so why don't we start right here with the, the person who had their hand up a second ago and then pull it down. Yeah. No, I understand, but we didn't have another one yet. So oh, OK. I had a comment for Mr. or Dr. Levicki about um, the um, saying that if you know that you're, um, you know your vulnerabilities, then you're, or you're, you, you, you can defend so then you can be invulnerable. I just as a sort of a, a middle manager IT type person for years, I have to disagree with that because I think that there's a lot of knowledge of what you're vulnerable about and getting people to do, to do something about it is, um, a sort of a major part of the problem, which I think mm -hmm. Mr. Lynn said, um, which also, uh, I, and then I just wondered about a comment, uh, if you gentlemen could comment on something <coughs> that I saw recently um, in the SANS news bites, which is sort of an aggregation of security little things about um, U.S. drones having been um, get, getting a virus in the last couple of weeks. And the U.S. Defense Departments are putting out spokespeople and saying, oh, it was nothing, don't worry about it, they just <coughs> stole the passwords. And I think, oh, I wonder what that means about having U.S. drones having um, their passwords stolen and having a virus. And, and, the, and from what Mr. the kind of denial of you know, the secrecy that um, Dr. Lynn was talking about. Let, let, let me respond to your comment. First of all, I'd like to say, you're correct. Practically, this is the thought I tell people. If I have something on my machine, on my network, that's of interest to a state intelligence agency and my network is connected to the internet, color it gone. Because there are so many ways to get into garden variety internet systems and so many unknown flaws. Okay, the, the jail will eventually find it. Now, the problem is that in many systems, not all systems, but in many systems, the greatest flaw is the user. The bad password, the poor habits, the difficulty in keeping patches, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And that leads to a different formulation. And the formulation is as follows. This world has agoras, and this world has castles. And certain things like castles, like the nuclear command and control system of the United States. And then there are other things like agoras, agoras such as Facebook. When we open ourselves up to the internet, we trade the virtues of openness for the pain of insecurity. 
And the question then becomes is do we understand the trade-off and are we making the trade-off correctly? If you're going to take a university, which is based on the open exchange of ideas, and wall it off from the uh, rest of the world, you're not doing yourself any favors. Okay? The trade-offs just aren't in the right place. Nuclear power plant, you flip it around. Okay? So it ends up that the most important piece of information you have when you're running a system is not the technical information. It's the self-understanding you have of what information is important to keep privileged and what information is not important to keep privileged. And you would be surprised how many people, in fact, it's pretty universal. You skip step one and you go to step two. You go to the technical means, okay, without considering the, the non-technical issues first. Um, you know, Sun Tzu was right. Self-knowledge is the beginning of all knowledge. Was it Plato? I think it was Plato talking to Sun Tzu. I think it was contemporary. Right, right. Uh, in response to your, your question about the, uh, uh, the virus on the Predator terminals, uh, I, I agree, you know, the Air Force Public Affairs handled that really poorly and, you know, they'll be working with that. But there's so much bad stuff sloshing around, even on military classified networks, it would just blow your mind. And I think if you kind of just think about the experience that you have, uh, you know, in your organizations, working with IT, um, having random blue screens of death, just having your... PC freeze and not knowing why and misfiling things, all of these normal things that you know are really funny to laugh about in Dilbert and the movie Office Space um, go on in the military in spades, and yet the organization continues to go on. So if you're going to attack uh, this organization, you better be, do more than just make a lot of noise and friction because it's very good at inflicting friction upon itself. So you know you got to be really, really targeted if you want to have something that's going to come out of the noise. So yeah, that's alarming. It, it, it's, it's, it's disturbing. Um, yet at the same time, uh, there are a lot of just normal glitches that go on uh, in, in the flying of these, these vehicles. That's why there's a man in the loop to kind of like deal and you know, manage those things when they happen. Actually, let, let me make another, another statement about the keystroke log in general. I don't know enough of the details of the actual incident at this point. <coughs> to say anything authoritative about the Air Force did or did not do. But not every vulnerability and not every attack is necessarily worthwhile, okay? Let us say I could collect the keystrokes on, and that's all I could do is collect the keystrokes of the folks who command and control of the UAVs, right? If I'm going through an air-gapped system, it's not gonna be instantaneous. I gotta get somebody to walk the USB drive in, I gotta get somebody later on to walk the keystrokes out. So you have to count on a certain lag which means I can't control the system. All I can do is learn about the system, right? And so in the end, I get this information back, and now I have two months worth of keystrokes on UAV operations that have come and gone a long time ago. And the next question is, was that worthwhile for the attacker? And the intelligence guys will always say yes. I don't necessarily trust them. And is that really such a problem for the Air Force? And the answer to that one, may, maybe no, it may be yes. You have to be able to translate one into the other. One of the things that made Stuxnet work is the, is the attackers, I was about to say who they were, right? The attackers didn't care when the, when, the, when the centrifuges crashed. They just wanted them to crash. A month later, two months later, four months later, eight months later, it was pretty much all the same. They were just here to break things. So Stuxnet was a one-way system. All they had to do was to get the worm from the open world to the closed world for the worm to do its work. Now let's say you want to take down an integrated air defense system. Um, I need a certain precision here, right? If I take it down a month before the war starts, it'll be patched up and running and harder. If I take it a month after the war starts, <coughs> my entire air defense system, you know, the war may be over anyhow. You've got to get the timing right. And not every vector that's used for a cyber attack can get the timing right, particularly when you're going through an air gap, which is probably more than you wanted to know, but there it is. Thank you. Yes, sir. So we've been talking a lot about um, theoretical stuff, um, which is great. It's really, really interesting stuff. But if I was a policymaker, I guess my question would be, so what does this mean for, um, the, for the US, for the US national security policies? Where do we go from here? Um, do we have to devote more to cyber um, research and development, more to cyber defenses? Um, what are your suggestions moving forward? Um, more for research and development. <laughs> More for FFRDCs. <laughs> Budget isn't the only isn't the only issue, uh, but there are certainly interesting problems in, in this space. 
Um, so just to give, let, me, let me give you just two examples of, of, uh, of interesting problems that <coughs> nobody really has any idea how to deal with. Uh, this is what you'd spend some of your R&D money on. Um, how do you tell the adversary that what you're doing is benign and exploitation rather than hostile, overtly hostile, an attack? When you launch an operation, how do you deal with it? How do you let the, the because you, you don't want the other guy overreacting. Okay. How, do you, how do you inform me? You don't call him up on the hotline and tell him, you know, this, the worm that you're seeing now is a friendly worm and it's just going to steal information. I mean, you're not going to do that, right? Well, but how will he know? Okay, and that's, that's a real, that, that's, there's another question. Let's say you're in a shooting war in cyberspace and you're, you're trading viruses or, or whatever. How do you know, and you, then you say no more. Peace. Stop. How do you know that the other guy has stopped shooting at you? How do you know that you've stopped shooting? How does he know that you stopped shooting at him? Okay. The, so let me give you an example of something that goes just completely <coughs> nuts. Okay. Because why? Because you have to use, you have to, you're still under cyber attack from everybody else. So does that mean that when I start the cyber war, I have to identify my, my, my malware with the inside there's a, a, a string that says this, is, this code comes from the US government and is part of a real attack so that when they Please no longer, so that when we stop, so that when we, we stop, we no longer send those packets. This gets into the surreal, okay? This is complete, what I'm proposing here, not seriously proposing for the tape, is, is completely, <laughs> it's completely ridiculous, okay? But how would you do it? What would you, how would you know that the other guy is complying with a cease, with a, quote, a cyber ceasefire? And what would that mean? I mean? Nobody has any idea how to deal with these issues. And it's not, it's not, it's partly a question of money, um, but it's really, nobody has good ideas about this stuff. Paul, oh, you wanna go next? Yeah, I, you know, my, <coughs> my biggest recommendation in, in this space is to, you know, relax, not go too fast. Military is gonna do what the military is gonna do, but because so much of this problem is based on the relationship between the private sector and the public sector, um, there are there is a tendency to reach for regulatory tools to perhaps, you know, enforce design requirements or you know, various requirements on the architecture of the internet, uh, which could have fairly adverse consequences for uh, the innovativeness, the economic productivity of the information economy, uh, civil liberties and privacy concerns are really big when you start thinking about security and automatically thinking that surveillance and security are the same and they're not. Um, so uh, in that case, I would say, you know, be very wary of precautionary reasoning that says computers are everywhere, threats are everywhere, and normatively adopt a commitment to trying to make sure that you have <coughs> proof and evidence and good reasoning before you have a regulatory intervention into you know, the market in order to manage. And, and, and I might not have made this clear. I mean, the private sector is, is essential because you know, they invent, own, and operate most of the infrastructure of cyberspace. Um, they create the vulnerabilities and therefore could reduce it if, if their incentives were different. So, um, you know, that's really kind of the long-term management issue, which is a different one than kind of the traditional, um, you know, self-enclosed military space of developing capabilities to affect the balance of power. Three things. First of all, I think the military has to understand what its performance would like be what its performance would be like under conditions of a first-rate cyber attack. My hunch is that we do not understand it nearly as well as we need to from a military's perspective. Number two, I would make sure that our electric grid is air-gapped. Used to be air-gapped, by the way, and then we start getting lazy. I think we have to return to air gap. Not because the likelihood of a wholesale attack on an electric grid is particularly high, but because the consequences are sufficiently serious and the number of people you would sort of discomfort, the whole notion of castles. I think the electric power grid is a castle. I think the number of people you inconvenience is relatively small. It sounds like a good trade-off to me. The third thing I would do is modulo number one and number two is to stop going around telling everybody how vulnerable we are. I, I just want to or ask a question to something Herb just said, but before that, I also kind of Say something there. When the National Security Agency was here last week, I don't know how many of you went to some of those. Some of the issue they're recommending is at least workforce, right? 
all the smart students in here need to be trained in, or we need to be training more people in the technical skills in order to at least understand some of the things they're talking about. So just my plug for engineering and computer science, even though I'm in sociology, so do that too. Um, but my question is for her, which is, um, you just said we announced that uh, this isn't a serious attack, this is just, uh, we're just looking around the network. Is that what China's doing? Because the, as you all, all three almost acknowledge, right, there's lots of evidence of, you know, China, what they, the persistent threat that we know from China, and I'm sure we're doing it the other way too. So why, is that sort of known and yet assumed to be not problematic? Not not problematic, but it's not it's not seen as an attack. It's just seen. We know state actors like China are in our networks. They're they're in a lot of you know secure networks, and <coughs> but it's not it's not really a threat. It's not an attack. And how do we know that? Because nothing bad is happening. Because the consequence isn't clear. That. And so I'm just, your, your opinion on that kind of thing. It's an interesting question as to whether China is sending, are you saying that, is China sending us a message? Is, is China trying to persuade us that they're benign? I don't know what they're right. doing. But know, right, right. There's, so there's lots of evidence on both <coughs> sides. I don't know on the Chinese side that there, there are those state actors who are able to penetrate lots of systems. <coughs> maybe, not the, maybe not the castles, but lots of things leading up to the castles. And yet this is not a provocation that would be if their ships were sitting off of our, off of our borders or something else. So, so how do we know, you said in these kinds of um, cyber locations, there isn't an announcement that this is not an attack, it's just time. <coughs> How do we know? How do we tell? Why are we assuming that in, in say, the, what, what China is doing to our networks and probably what we're doing to China's networks? It, it's, I, I, I don't know how to, I have no idea how to answer that. I, mean, I think that the, we think that the Chinese are only <coughs> Stealing information because that's what we that's what we've discovered. Once we have we know what the once we have the code, and we are, we're able to take the time to do a serious analysis of it and to figure out who it's communicated with, and, you know, and, and so on, and all this other stuff, we have some idea of what it's of what it's doing. But in the heat of a crisis, I mean, that's hard. You, you don't worry so much about this in under peacetime conditions because I mean, there's not a war going on. Okay, and so you have the time to actually conduct some analysis to tell you. But if you're in the, if tensions are rising, it becomes a really pressing issue to know whether something is benign or something is, is, is malicious. And I would just make the observation that in times of tension, when conflict is, likelihood is, is rising, your intelligence demands go up. So you really want information on what their nuclear command and control system is doing, for example, some, some other guys. You really want to be in there to understand that when they move their mobile missiles around, it's a routine exercise, not being provocative. So you really want to know that. So you're going to increase your efforts. But if they see you at that time wandering around in their nuclear command and control system, you dare say they might get upset. A little nervous. Right. So the, the, my only point is that it's a... Nobody knows how to deal with this problem technically um, or, or procedurally. It's just an, uh, how do you deal with it? No one knows. Herb, on this exact point um, about the kind of the gray area between <coughs> benign espionage and actual attacks, uh -huh. can you can you relate just a little bit of what you were t you t uh, telling me about these hooks about? Oh, sure. Uh, so some years ago, two years ago now, there were some reports that were broken in the Wall Street Journal that yeah. the Chinese had penetrated <coughs> our electric grid. And big, big front page story about, about how the ch penetration of the, of the electric grid, and this was really, really serious. Okay. And that's as far as the story went. But I've, I've talked to people in the electric power industry, and I say, what did you actually find? The answer that came back was, 
We never found any actual malware. We found, what we found was hooks, placed vulnerabilities that were introduced so that you could download something into it. But there wasn't actually anything bad there that, could be, that would actually cause damage. It was just opening up a hole that a knowledgeable person could penetrate later on. Now, how do you interpret that? I mean, on one hand, that's actually, I'd say that's the really the sensible thing to do. Okay? You don't want to leave any smoking gun there that says that you're going to, you know, it's going to destroy the information. That's what you would want to do because you can always upload your, your information to it later on if, when you want to. And that's the, that's the story. Where in the networks were, the, were those hooks? I was it on the sorry? Was it on the generation side, the control side, the, the rest of the, the office network? The, it was on the generation. It was on the as I understand it, it was on the generation uh, uh -huh. on, on, on the on the operational side, not the business <laughs> side. But the fact that it was on the it could have been on the business side too. Those you'd expect those to be a lot more a, a lot more vulnerable. But sometimes the business side talks to the operational side directly too. So. And then there's operations and there's operations. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I actually I'm constantly struck by the by again cyber feels so different, but the analogies to conventional warfare, where for so many years you read stories about oh U.S. aircraft um, near Soviet airspace were escorted out. What were they doing? They were establishing hooks. Which they were basically doing is they were mapping altitudes and locations where they would or would not be detected by radars. Exactly the same sort of thing. Establishing opportunities for attacks they prosecute later. Um, is there a student? Yet yeah, uh, a student? Yes, and then I'll try to. Uh, there's a student up there too. Okay. Um, yes, yes, sir, and I'll come here. And if we if we do have time, otherwise I just invite you. Whoever the, who's the third student here? And if we do have, if we don't have time, I'll invite you to come up and talk with them afterwards. But yes, certainly. I just have a quick comment on what she just said right now, how uh, the National Security Agency came trying to recruit people to work for them. Last week, I read an article on the Financial Times saying, if there's a front page article on cyber militia in China, saying China's organizing um, people in small groups that they all have daytime jobs, but after that, they, come to, they, they get together and they, they, I think they work on cyber attacks and cyber defense. And they're enlisted under the army, the Chinese, you know, I'm not sure what it was called, but the yeah. Chinese army, yeah, right. So I'm not sure if that's any of them. Is that, it seems, it seems to be alarming to me that they're doing that, but we're not. So I'm not sure how to interpret that in the sense of like, attack competitiveness. And defense. Well, yeah. the, oh, sorry, John, actually, let me suggest something, because we have three more questions. Let me take, pick up that question, pick up the question from the gentleman in the back, and pick up this question, and then three of you guys can each have one more time to answer whichever parts of those you'd like to. So that's question number one. Gentleman in the back. Uh, I've heard this <coughs> groups like Anonymous and WallSec that have been in the news a lot lately for, like, uh, you know, bringing down major websites and stealing confidential information. And it seems like these attacks are being executed at a precise time on a precise target and they're not too hard to coordinate. So I was just wondering if that could ever pose some kind of national security threat and how those kind of attacks can be dealt with. And the last question, John. <coughs> so my, my question is how has the, the spread of, I guess you could say, commodity systems really changed the game? I mean, everybody's running Windows systems now, it seems like. Um, so how do we, so how do we well yeah because I thought the people coming back here um, so how has that kind of changed the um, changed the game so to say I mean now if you see a vulnerability in a system there's a good chance that that same vulnerability is sitting on somebody else's system um, and does does that does that kind of cut down on your on your um, I guess on your on your barrier does that reduce the barrier to to attack essentially. Why don't I just work down the line? Well, John, you start, then, you, uh, uh, then Martin, then Herb, and then we'll, we'll close down and okay. address whatever parts of this you'd like. I, I think I can link these two together, actually. Um, China is always very, very murky because you have a lot of activity, and the degree of the state is always the question. Um, uh, how much is there a, an explicit you know, relationship between the PLA and the state? How much of this is just encouraged or tolerated? Uh, and I think there's a great deal uh, of that, you know, the so-called patriotic uh, hacking uh, movement. Um, and, and there's all sorts of interesting connections. I mean, just the fact that the Chinese government has been, has this big push towards indigenous innovation to encourage uh, companies to develop their own version of whatever is uh, the cutting edge thing creates this great underground market for, um, you know, pri private gray side um, hackers to 
provide industrial espionage services for those Chinese companies. But at the same time, American companies want to be in China, you know, um, we need China to buy our debt, so like, we don't necessarily want to poke them in the eye that much. You don't ask questions that you want to answer for. Um, so I think the link here is, you know, you ask, well, there's all this stuff they're doing, but we're not. Um, I think that even though the motivations are very different, and you know, as an American, I'm glad that we have groups like this doing this in some situations, not all. But uh, you know, we have a large number of you know motivated private sector, some with help from the government. For example, using the Tor Onion Router, which was developed by the Office of Naval Research and is now a major tool for groups that are trying to empower dissidents in authoritarian uh, societies to communicate with one another. Encouraging of democratic movements. I mean, if you're an authoritarian company country and you see you know tools that are developed by the US government funding that's coming from the State Department to encourage you know your citizens to uh, subvert your internet that starts to look like patriotic hacking I guess I'm next um, I'm a little less I'm, a little, I'm less worried about the Chinese militias just like I'm less worried about going against an Air Force based on a bunch of part-timers um, if you're going to be a good hacker, you have to be a good hacker. And it's got to be a full-time job, and you've got to be supported by intelligence. Other than that, you, it gets back to the second question. You end up painting mustache, virtual mustaches on websites. And I'm sorry, I'm not particularly impressed. And I forgot the third question. Commodity systems. Commodity systems make things, make hacking a good deal easier. Um, actually, let me take 30 seconds. You're all familiar with what this is. I'm not going to sell you, uh, sell you one of these things. But I will tell you there's no malware for it. Now, the reason there's no malware for it is not because Apple has better security engineers than Microsoft does. In fact, Microsoft's is slightly better. If you compare the Mac to a PC, they're about six of one, half a dozen of the other. And I think on technical grounds, the PC has a slight edge. The reason that this is far less subject to malware is because it's a closed system. And the reason it's a closed system is because Apple makes more money that way. The bottom line here is, Different architectures produce vastly different consequences for cybersecurity. I'm not saying it's probable, but I will say that it's possible that 20 years from now we'll look back on this era, this interlude of cyber dependence, and say, what were we thinking? Why did we build our systems in such a way that anybody could do anything to all of them, okay? When there are much better ways of designing critical systems. I'll, I'll follow up on, uh, on this one primarily. I, I think that it's certainly true that monoculture has its, has its drawbacks, but there are also many advantages to, to monoculture, um, ease of maintenance and, you know, and, and, and so on. Um, and it's a, it's, it's a, it's a trade-off. Uh, there are people who think, from a technical standpoint, think about how you generate 17 different versions of Windows or, or, or something like that um, <coughs> in other critical places. Uh, there, so there's, there's active research of that. I'll point out that it's not, at this point, the most malicious vector is not operating systems. It's targeting Flash, okay. Adobe Flash. Um, and though, uh, Adobe is now the, the most uh, serious problem uh, in, in this. So we're going to develop a theory of war based on a middle-sized <laughs> Silicon Valley company sloppy. <laughs> Hey, as I said at the very beginning, this is the first of what I believe will be a four-part <coughs> series. And I have to say, I can't imagine a better way to have kicked this off than with these three very provocative presentations. So please join me in thanking our guests.